All right, welcome back, everybody. Please take your seats. So let me start with a brief announcement uh, on the tomorrow morning program. So uh, the HPP prize winner talk from 10.30 to 11.30 will be by Professor Christodoulou. So I think we'll update the program, but that's just for you to know what's actually to come tomorrow. And now I'm very happy to introduce our next plenary speaker, Marco Gualtieri. So Marco got his PhD in Oxford in 2004, and then for his work he won many prizes. Maybe I should mention Andrea Lichnirovich Prize and Andrea Eisenstadt Prize, and uh, just this year the new Kathleen Singe Moravitz Prize and he is one of the first recipients. Marco is a professor in mathematics at the University of Toronto, uh, and he is uh, famous, among various things, for uh, developing the theory of generalized complex structures. Uh, so today he will be speaking on generalized Kelly geometry and quantization. So Marco, I give you the floor. Thank you, Anton, and thank you to the organizers. Um, it's a great privilege for me to uh, be able to present this uh, project, the results of this project. Um, um, I've worked on several things over the years, but recently uh, I've returned to one of the most fundamental problems that, um, that we encountered when we were first uh, developing generalized complex geometry with Nigel Hitchin, my former advisor. So I will first um, explain the motivation. Um, so this is going back to uh, the work that I did with Hitchin in, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, it was the development of a geometric structure called a generalized complex structure. And this is just a complex structure on not the tangent bundle, but the sum of the tangent and cotangent bundles. And uh, just as in the case for a complex structure where you require that it's integrable with respect to the Lie bracket, here we have another bracket, which is called the Courant bracket. This Courant bracket was uh, developed by the Weinstein School. Uh, Alan Weinstein was studying Dirac structures and uh, came up with this Courant bracket. Um, and uh, the, uh, this innocent definition uh, of a complex structure on this larger bundle uh, incorporates uh, two uh, classical geometric structures. You can see here how a symplectic structure acts. It acts by taking t to t star and t star back to t by using the symplectic form. And you can see here how a complex structure acts in a more straightforward way, sending t to itself and t star to itself. And there are things in between, and these are all called generalized complex structures. Now, this talk is not really about generalized complex structures, but I need it as an ingredient. So let me just tell you some of the more interesting facts about generalized complex structures. First, their deformation theory. Well, when you deform a symplectic structure, um, when you deform a symplectic structure, what happens is that you get not only the deformation of the symplectic form, but also the turning on of a B field, which is familiar in physics. So you get the second cohomology group with complex coefficients. This is sometimes called the complexified Kähler cone in the mirror symmetry. Um, on the other hand, if we deform the complex structure, what we find is that we get not only the usual classical deformations of complex structure, we also get these, which are called Jerby deformations, the H2O, and we also get this highlighted piece of holomorphic bivector fields. This is uh, an interesting result uh, for two reasons. Uh, the, second, uh, the, the first reason is that uh, these are holomorphic bivector fields and they lead to holomorphic Poisson structures. And we know that holomorphic Poisson structures uh, are deformations in the direction of non-commutative geometry. So this indicates that deforming the generalized complex structure from the classical complex structure seems to be moving in the non-commutative direction. Okay, and this was a mysterious um, hint from the early days. The other reason why it's interesting is that these deformations coincide with the deformations of the famous B model, 
uh, in, um, in topological quantum field theory, uh, the A and the B models are, are associated to symplectic and complex structures, and they are related by mirror symmetry. Um, and, um, and so what we see is that the deformations of both, of the ge uh, of both geometric structures agree with the deformations of the physical models that um, they give rise to. Um, and then finally, uh, the uh, category of boundary conditions for this sigma model uh, these boundary conditions are basically boundary conditions for uh, strings, uh, open strings, the endpoints of the strings can end on certain special submanifolds, which are equipped with uh, unitary connections. And in the, uh, in the case of the complex structure, we get um, kind of holomorphic vector bundles on, gen uh, on complex submanifolds, whereas on, on the symplectic side, we get Lagrangians and I put an asterisk there because there are more than just Lagrangians. And uh, there are these so-called co-isotropic A-brains, which were discovered by Kapustin and Orlov in, in 2001. Uh, but the point of this is that uh, these structures, these submanifolds, they are natural objects from the point of view of generalized complex geometry. So in some sense, the generalized complex structures, they are, uh, they are somehow um, the natural geometric structure associated to these um, uh, topological sigma models in dimension two. Okay, so, um, so let's focus on these non-commutative deformations, these Poisson structures. So if, if, I, um, if I choose a section in uh, H0 of wedge 2t, this is a holomorphic bivector. Uh, if I write it in terms of its real and imaginary parts, I can put uh, this information together uh, to, get a, um, to get a generalized complex structure, which is one of these things in between. It, uh, it looks almost like a complex structure because of the diagonal elements, but it has this Poisson structure here. And in order for this to be integrable, uh, <clears throat> this is an equivalent condition for um, this bivector being holomorphic and uh, for being Poisson. In other words, it defines a Poisson bracket on the holomorphic functions. And the main question, and this is one that we've had for almost 20 years now, which is, does this indicate that generalized complex geometry gives us a geometric approach to studying non-commutative algebraic geometry? Now, I just wanna make a, a, an important, uh, an important uh, disambiguation right now. I'm not talking about C star algebra and non-commutative geometry in the sense of con. I'm, I'm talking about uh, holomorphic non-commutative geometry, uh, things like the Scleanin algebra or um, other types of um, non-commutative uh, algebraic structures um, so they don't involve a norm or a metric. So this question has been tantalizing us for um, more than 15 years. And, um, and I've been working on it for, uh, for all of that time, uh, you know, in, in and out, uh, on and off. And recently, um, with a former PhD student of mine, Francis Bischoff, who was in Oxford as a postdoc, um, we finally uh, kind of came up with a viable method for um, linking generalized complex structures to non-commutative algebraic geometry. Um, we uh, we uh, expect this paper to arrive on the archive today. <laughs> So hopefully you can check that uh, after my talk later on today. Um, so as it says in the abstract, uh, we propose a non-commutative generalization of the relationship between compact Kähler manifolds, a geometric structure on the one hand, and complex projective algebraic varieties on the other hand, right? So we have geometry and algebra, okay, uh, in the commutative case. And then these compact Kähler manifolds, they deform into generalized complex structures. Okay, and so then on the other, ha on the other hand, we would like to have non-commutative projective algebraic geometries. And the point of this paper is to explain the sequence of ideas which gets you from A to B, and um, furthermore, implementing those ideas for a particular case. Uh, and we implement that for all um, uh, all compact toric Kähler manifolds 
um, equipped with an R matrix holomorphic Poisson structure. So we, we basically explain how you can take a toric variety, any toric variety, compact toric variety, um, deform it as a generalized complex manifold, and then through, through a sequence of operations, obtain a non-commutative algebra. Okay, so this is, this is the, um, the map of uh, the concepts that I will present, and that uh, it also coincides with the, basically the table of contents of the paper. Um, we start in the top left corner with a Kähler structure. Okay, we, we look at the Kähler structure as a symplectic structure with a complex structure that serves as a so-called complex polarization. This is familiar from geometric quantization. Um, and from this uh, polarization, we're going to see that we, we could produce a quantization and an algebra. Okay, and this is classical um, algebraic geometry on the top left-hand side. And I won't, I won't explain everything in the diagram now. We'll, we'll come back to it later. Um, then I, I will explain how um, this quantization can be reinterpreted. That's just the usual Kähler quantization. Uh, so no deformation. So I will explain how, by going uh, down in this diagram, this is called the cotangent lift, I will explain how this quantization could have been obtained in a different way on an auxiliary space, which in this case is the cotangent bundle of the original Kähler manifold. And this cotangent bundle will have a pair of brains on it, and that will give rise to the quantization and to the algebra. Okay, so this uh, going from the top left to the bottom left, this is just a reinterpretation of the classical um, relationship between geometry and algebra in algebraic geometry. And then I will explain how we can deform the top left into the generalized case by turning on a holomorphic Poisson structure. And then I will obtain two brains there as well, and I would like to compute the Homs um, between them, the Homs space, to get a quantization of that deformation. And then I would like to construct this graded algebra just as I did before, and that should be the non-commutative algebra. So it would be beautiful if we could go from the top left to the top right, just deform the entire classical construction and get a non-commutative algebra. Unfortunately, this is not possible at this time um, because while, while several of the elements in the classical case do generalize, they do uh, deform, some of the elements do not. And in particular, the, the important part, the part which defines a vector space for the algebra and which defines the product structure doesn't deform in an obvious way. And so we have not been able to go um, directly uh, generalizing the classical construction. So instead, we need to do this cotangent lift. We need to do this um, alternative construction and deform that. Then we're going to get to the bottom right-hand corner, and here you see uh, this scary uh, concept of the symplectic groupoid, which is something that I had to learn in the intervening years. And this was a concept, again, also developed by the Weinstein School of Poisson Geometry. And um, what we'll see is that um, this is just a usual symplectic manifold. So unlike the top row, where a usual Kähler manifold gets deformed into some kind of exotic structure, in the bottom row, this cotangent bundle deforms to another symplectic manifold. But it has an additional structure, which is called a groupoid structure. From the point of view of geometry, however, it's just a symplectic structure and it has two brains. I can take the hom between them, at least I can try. That's what we propose a definition for. And uh, an algebra, which we propose a def definition for. And we check uh, in, in this um, toric case that this uh, bottom right-hand square all works. So we use basically the bottom right-hand square to define the top right-hand square. Okay, That's how we get around this problem of brains in generalized complex manifolds while the brains exist, their um, morphism spaces do not. Sorry, so that was just an overview. That, that, is, that is basically the, the summary of the talk. But I will now go into greater detail. 
OK, so let's start with the top left corner. So um, this is something that most people will be familiar with. Uh, it is the geometric quantization of Kähler manifolds. And um, basically, you just start um, with a uh, symplectic manifold. Um, you assume that the symplectic form has integer periods so that we can find a pre-quantization. This was the contribution of Costant back in the 60s, uh, whose curvature, its curvature of this uh, unitary connection is the symplectic form. Okay, and then you would like to take the flat sections of this line bundle. That would produce you a vector space, and that would be the quantization. Of course, you cannot do this because it has curvature. So what you do is you choose a so-called polarization which is an additional structure. In this case, the, uh, the easiest way to do that is to choose a complex structure. If you have a complex structure which is compatible with the symplectic form, then it allows you to take this connection and project only the anti-holomorphic part and then look at the, the, the kernel of that. So we're not looking at fully flat sections, but only half flat sections, namely holomorphic sections. And that gives us the quantization of the Kähler manifold. So it's very easy to produce the Hilbert space, uh, the quantization of a Kähler manifold, um, assuming these conditions. OK. Now, uh, it's a very famous problem. Um, uh, I mean, in physical situations, it is expected that this quantization should be independent of the polarization. And there, there are some very famous cases uh, in particular, uh, there are, uh, there's this uh, famous connection called the Hitchin-Witten connection, uh, which was developed uh, in the case of Chern-Simons theory, the quantization of uh, uh, the Hamiltonian approach to Chern-Simons theory. Uh, this was a major problem. They needed to check that the quantization was independent of polarization, and that was what uh, Hitchin and Witten uh, solved. And some really interesting work by Jürgen Andersen recently um, has been generalizing that to other cases. However, um, you know, it must be said that this quantization in general, uh, it, it, should, it, it will depend on the polarization uh, unless you have some additional reason um, or some additional argument. But in any case, in good cases, this should be independent of polarization. On the other hand, there's something interesting that we can do, which is to rescale this symplectic form. If we rescale it to get 2 omega, 3 omega, 4 omega, okay, each of these will have a quantization, and that quantization will be of a larger and larger dimension. But uh, the really interesting thing about these quantizations for the various powers of the pre-quantum line bundle is that they have a tensor product structure, and therefore we get an algebra. So we can tensor sections like this, and, you know, we get a graded algebra. And the uh, interesting thing about this algebra is that, uh, as everyone in algebraic geometry knows, the Kodaira embedding theorem tells you that this algebra basically embeds your complex manifold into complex projective space as the zero set of a bunch of polynomials. And so um, you definitely get a very explicit description of the polarization from this algebra. So the algebra is definitely not independent of polarization. It completely captures the polarization. And, um, and I just want to make one a slight, uh, just one small observation, which is that you know, these are holomorphic sections. And so what we're really doing here is that we have, an, we have a, a holomorphic line bundle, which is an object in the category of coherent sheaves on the complex manifold. And we have an uh, endofunctor, which is just taking any vector bundle or sheaf and tensoring it by this pre-quantum line bundle. So this is an auto-equivalence of the category of coherent sheaves, which is really the B model category for physicists. It's the uh, category of boundary conditions for the B model. And so this could be rewritten as saying the following, that we have the structure sheaf, the trivial line bundle. And then we just apply this functor successively to the trivial bundle and take homomorphisms between them. That reproduces exactly this calculation. And so that's why I say that the geometric quantization in this format is the B model approach because it's using the
the complex structure, it's using the B model in order to get the algebra. Okay, so geometric quantization, here's the quantization, and here's the algebra. The geometric quantization might be independent of polarization, but the algebra certainly is not. Okay, now I, I just want to explain going vertically down from the top left to the top to the bottom left in my original diagram. So I'd like to give you a different approach to Kähler geometry. So, so far, nothing has been deformed. I'm just going to do what I just did again. We can encode ge the Kähler geometry as a pair of brains, A brains, in the cotangent bundle of the Kähler manifold. So take the cotangent bundle. It has a canonical symplectic form. And of course, we have a natural Lagrangian submanifold, which is just the zero section of the cotangent bundle with a trivial flat connection. So this is a Lagrangian brain. Uh, people who study the Fukaya category or the A model would know this brain very, very well. Uh, but there is another brain now that we get, which is one that the Fukaya category theorists do not study. Um, th these brains were discovered by Kapustin and Orlov. Um, they are called space-filling brains. Actually, Kapustin and Orlov discovered co-isotropic brains of many different types. But the space-filling ones, they consist of a line bundle with unitary connection on the whole symplectic manifold, whose curvature, f hat, when you combine it with the symplectic form in this way, what you get is a holomorphic symplectic structure. Uh, uh, in, in other words, it, this combination of the curvature and the symplectic form on the ambient space, they form a complex two-form, which actually defines a complex structure and which uh, defines a holomorphic symplectic structure. So, so if you can find a unitary uh, connection on a symplectic manifold for which this is the case, that's called a space-filling brain. And um, uh, according to mirror symmetry, these are definitely, these definitely should be included in the Fukaya category uh, in order to get perfect mirror symmetry uh, between the A and the B model. So how are we going to get this space-filling brain on this cotangent bundle? Well, you pull back the pre-quantum line bundle from M to its cotangent bundle. You pull back its unitary connection, and you make a slight modification which uses the real part of the canonical primitive of this holomorphic symplectic form. So the holomorphic symplectic form on the Kähler form, it will have imaginary part being the canonical symplectic form, but it will have a real part that goes along with it. That real part is exact as well as the imaginary part. And that real part, we added in uh, to modify this connection. And uh, one can check that this satisfies precisely this, connect, uh, this condition and defines a space-filling brain, which encodes the, the pre-quantum line bundle. And if we take these two brains, uh, this uh, space-filling one and this Lagrangian one, and if we intersect them, well, okay, that's easy to do because this is space-filling and this is only Lagrangian, so the intersection will be the Lagrangian. And if we uh, take this um, connection and restrict it to this line bundle, uh, sorry, restrict it to this Lagrangian, what we get is the pre-quantum line bundle back again. So we recover the Kähler structure by taking the intersection of the two brains. Okay, not only this, but because of this fact, because of this fact that um, we have a, a holomorphic symplectic form associated to this um, connection, what we could do is modify this so that it's no longer unitary, but so, so that its curvature is the entire f hat plus i omega. So here I've, I've taken this connection, which remember was given here. I, I got this by adding the real part. Now I add the imaginary part to it, but I don't use an i, there's no i here. And so this is no longer unitary. What I get is a complex connection on a complex line bundle whose curvature is holomorphic symplectic. So this is what I call a holomorphic pre-quantization of the space-filling brain. It's a, it's a kind of holomorphic version of what you normally do in geometric quantization. So this is a purely holomorphic object, uh, not unitary anymore. Okay, and um, 
so following following the logic or following the uh, inspiration given by geometric quantization, because I have this holomorphic pre-quantization, um, we also choose a holomorphic Lagrangian polarization, which is a, pol a foliation of the manifold, in this case, the cotangent bundle, by its cotangent fibers, which are holomorphic Lagrangian submanifolds. So this is the picture of what we have. We have the cotangent bundle fibering over the manifold. This is my original Kähler manifold. And instead of studying the Kähler structure here, what I do is take the, the I take the, um, the pre-quantum line bundle on M and I pull it back to the cotangent bundle and modify it slightly so that I get a space-filling brain in red. And then I have this natural Lagrangian brain, which is a, just the zero section. So then I can uh, define the quantization just as I did before, except that now I work in the cotangent bundle. So I have these two brains. I take the homomorphisms between them in the A model. So this is the A model approach to the same exact vector space. Um, how am I going to take the homomorphisms between a Lagrangian and a space-filling brain? Well, one way to do it is to use this polarization and take holomorphic flat sections along the polarization. So look for leaves of the polarization for which the holonomy of the connection of this um, holomorphic connection is trivial. And these are called the Bohr-Sommerfeld or the holomorphic Bohr-Sommerfeld leaves. Uh, but you only look at those which actually intersect with the Lagrangian. Now, in this case, it's very simple. All of the bohr all of the leaves are Bohr-Sommerfeld, and they all intersect L. And so we basically end up um, uh, computing exactly the holomorphic sections of L, which is what we got in the B model approach. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, instead of using the B model, for using the complex structure of M, it is possible to get the quantization of the Kähler manifold by using the A model um, on the cotangent bundle. Now, that gives us the, the quantization. Now, what about the algebra? The algebra is actually much more interesting from this point of view, um, because here we need to use the fact that the cotangent bundle has a multiplication, quote unquote, operation. This multiplication is just the fiber-wise addition. If you take two co-vectors, co you can add them together as long as they're over the same point. So this is what I've denoted by this plus here, that if I have two co-vectors over the same point, I could add them together because um, it's a vector bundle. And as a result of this, um, it turns out that this operation preserves the symplectic structure uh, on this ambient space. And that is what, uh, that is an example. It's an extremely simple example of what's called a symplectic groupoid. You have this operation, this com composition operation, which preserves the symplectic structure. And so this is what uh, Weinstein called a symplectic groupoid. And as a result of this, we can take these brains and we can convolve them using this operation. We can take a brain here, a brain here, and then we can pass over to the right-hand side and get another brain. So that means that we can take the convolution of L with itself. Well, it's no surprise, the zero section added to itself is giving just the zero section. So this one is idempotent. Uh, and then we take this space filling brain and we uh, tensor it with itself or convolve it with itself and we get another brain, um, which, uh, you know, it's going to, this one is going to have twice the symplectic area or twice the churn class um, of, of, this, uh, of this bundle U. And so in this way, I can produce a sequence of brains inside this cotangent bundle. This sequence um, uh, uh, is obtained just by using the multiplicative structure on this background. And um, yeah, and, and then uh, I, can take the, I, take, I can take the sum of these homomorphisms and this will have a natural algebra structure on it. And uh, this is just an A model way of producing um, uh, of producing the same algebra that we saw before. So this idea, um, this idea uh, that the symplectic groupoid structure should, in, should endow 
the, uh, the Foucault category of the symplectic groupoid with a monoidal structure is one that a few people have thought of. I've, I've thought about it for a very long time and um, I've discussed it with Weinstein for a long time. And also um, some people in the Foucault category uh, community have started looking at this idea. There is a, a former student of uh, Denis Ohu uh, called Alexander Subotic. Um, there's also another former student of Denis Ohu uh, whose name is James Paskalev, who has a beautiful paper about this idea of using the symplectic groupoid to endow the groupoid uh, Foucault category with a monoidal structure. And here we see that we need this monoidal structure as well, uh, not just on Lagrangians, but also on space-filling brains. So, okay, so this is just an A-model approach to the quantization of Kähler manifolds. Okay, so um, at this point, it's a good, so now we've done the, the left-hand column. Uh, I've explained the traditional approach to quantizing Kähler, and then this alternative approach where we lift the cotangent bundle. Why, why did I bother doing this? The reason is because it is, as I explained before, it is this um, A model approach which appears to generalize when we deform into the non-commutative direction. Any, any questions at this point? I think it's a good time to ask for questions. If not, I'll, I'll continue, but if, uh, uh, but the... Um, uh, Marco, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, I think there are no questions so far, but... Uh, okay, great. All right. So now let's move on to deforming. So, um, so what we have here is a holomorphic Poisson structure. It's a section of uh, wedge 2T. And it has real and imaginary parts. I can take this real, this imaginary part, and I can place it here and create a generalized complex structure. This is a operator on T plus T star, which deforms the complex structure. If Q is zero, then all I have is the usual complex structure on T and the dual complex structure on T star. Um, so this is a natural deformation uh, uh, of, of the complex geometry. And so I'm moving along the top horizontal row of my diagram. I'm, I'm deforming the fundamental structure. Um, and, and really, if you think about it, what I'm doing is I'm deforming the polarization that I'm using for geometric quantization. So I have this symplectic manifold in the background, and I chose a complex structure as a polarization. And it turns out that you can think that you could deform that polarization um, in, in, uh, in a more exotic direction, uh, uh, namely this one. So um, this uh, is now a generalized complex structure. And uh, um, in the 2000s, I defined what brains are for these generalized complex structure. A brain would be, uh, at least if it's space filling, it would be a line bundle with a unitary connection um, so that the graph of the curvature, if I think of the curvature as a map, from T to T star, that would have a graph, a graph which would sit inside T plus T star, and, for, and this would act on that graph, and I need that graph to be stable. It needs to be sent to itself by this operator. So it's a natural kind of invariance condition for the uh, generalized complex structure. And if you work that out, you'll see that it satisfies this bizarre nonlinear condition that the curvature combines with the complex structure and the uh, Poisson structure in this particular way. Now, if this wasn't there, then this part here is just telling you that the curvature is of type 1, 1, which is part of the Kähler geometry condition. This condition is a generalization of that, and it actually defines what's called a generalized Kähler structure, which is something I've spent a lot of time researching as well, many other people have, have, have as well. But, um, but the point is that um, that we uh, um, by deforming the complex structure, we deform the notion of a brain. It's no longer a, a holomorphic line bundle. It's no longer a line bundle with uh, curvature type one one. It's rather a line bundle with curvature that satisfies this twisted one one condition, where the twist comes from the Poisson st structure. So these are uh, kind of unusual types of objects. 
And um, the question is, how can we actually produce these things? Um, how can we actually find uh, these brains? Well, um, uh, in a previous paper of mine, I showed that if the pre-quantum line bundle, the original pre-quantization of the Kähler manifold, uh, if it actually is compatible with the Poisson structure in the sense that it's a Poisson module, what, are, what is a Poisson module? It means that the Poisson structure of the base lifts to a C star invariant Poisson structure on the line bundle, okay, which descends, you know, it's it's a it lifts to it. So it, that means that if you push it down, you get you recover the original Poisson structure. So under this condition, uh, the the pre quantum line bundle deforms to precisely one of these brains. Uh, it deforms to a brain. How do you do it? It's actually a very simple construction, although it took us a long time to find it. It's based on uh, some observations of a number of people uh, over several years. But one way to do it is to choose a metric on the line bundle, a Hermitian metric. This defines a function on the total space, but the total space, as I just said, has a Poisson structure. And so this function gives rise to a Q Hamiltonian vector field, a, a vector field on the total space of the line bundle. And that is going to be C star invariant. Or at least, uh, sorry, it's going to be at least uh, um, uh, S1 invariant. And then that vector field descends to a vector field on M, which is also, uh, um, uh, yeah, which is also a real vector field and gives rise to a diffeomorphism flow. And if we uh, drag the um, pre-quantization connection and average it under this flow, we get an averaged connection, which is also unitary. And it turns out that um, that this um, that this is actually um, a brain uh, on the generalized complex structure. So we have a method for producing these brains. Um, oh, and of course, I should mention that this uh, an easy way to get a solution to this is to take f equals zero, and so we have a trivial brain. So on our generalized complex manifold, okay, our pre-quantum line bundle. Uh, has, de ha has a deformation to a brain. So we've successfully uh, deformed both the structure sheaf to a trivial brain and the pre-quantum line bundle to a non-trivial brain. And so now that we have our trivial brain and our deformed pre-quantum brain, we would love to just say that the quantization is the homomorphisms between them in the category of brains for the complex structure, for the generalized complex structure. And similarly, uh, for the algebra, there is a, a deformation of the autoequivalence. Instead of tensoring things by L, you pull them back by this time one flow and tensor them with L. So this is the deformation of the operation of tensoring by L, which remember was this autoequivalence of the B model category, which we use to construct our sequence of brains and, um, and then we could just take the homomorphisms between the trivial brain and this sequence, and that would give us an algebra. So this is our, this was the original, um, you know, this is what we thought we could do many years ago. Um, but the problem is that morphisms between generalized complex brains are not defined at this time. Um, the deformed B model approach is stuck. And I have looked into the physics literature to try to see whether there are some localization ar arguments which tell us what uh, the morphism spaces between the GC brains are, but uh, to no avail. So this is an open problem uh, to this day. And what I'm going to describe next is a workaround for this problem. So let's go back to the project summary. We started with a Kähler structure with a traditional complex polarization. We saw that we could get a quantization by taking the Homs between the trivial and the pre-quantum brain. We have an endo functor, which is just tensoring things by L. And then we apply the endo functor um, K times and produce this graded algebra. And that, by Kodaira embedding, recovers the complex structure uh, I. And it gives you, it gives you a, a notion of algebraic geometry. The cotangent lift produces exactly the same type of data and the same sequence, except that here we have to use a space filling brain. We have to use the A model, and we need to use the tensor product structure, which comes from the groupoid structure. Okay, and then I explained that we have a deformation 
of the brains, assuming that L was a holomorphic Poisson module, and uh, of the endofunctor, because we have this flow of this Hamiltonian vector field, and we would love to be able to compute these, but they are undefined. So that's what I've covered so far, and now we, what remains is this, and this is the content of our paper. Okay. So what I'd like to explain is that although we cannot compute morphisms here, it turns out that this generalized complex deformation has a natural symplectic groupoid associated to it, which is different from and is a deformation of this cotangent bundle. And in this symplectic groupoid, it turns out that the exact same structure that we have here um, can be brought over, and we have exactly the same type of homomorphisms as we did here. And that is the, that is the main idea, that we can take this cotangent lift idea and, and deform that. Okay, so let's see. So in this diagram, what you see is that um, this is supposed to be the B model. This is an A model. This is an A model. And this is a null model at this time anyway, 2021. Okay, so let me explain in the last uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, well, uh, actually, maybe the last 15 minutes. Um, given what, when we started, um, uh, Marco, let me just explain. Yes. Yeah, we started ten minutes late, right? So you you so still I should have go some until, time. I should go until eleven ten or. Um, well, I mean, we can negotiate a little bit, but certainly you still have time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so any generalized comp. So let me explain now how you do the A model approach to this problem. Any generalized complex structure looks like this, and it has up here a real Poisson structure Q. And this real, uh, real Poisson structure Q, um, we should try to integrate it. This is the terminology that is used in the Weinstein School. Um, the, you know, this is a very well-developed subject uh, over th three decades or more um, to a symplectic groupoid. This symplectic groupoid is a symplectic manifold which has a composition law. We can think of the points of the symplectic groupoid as arrows, which have a source in the manifold and a target in the manifold. So you can think, this is a picture that I like to think about. Each point, oops, each point in here represents an arrow from the manifold to itself. It has a source and it has a target. And um, it has a composition. So if we have two arrows, which agree tip to tail, then we can compose them. And this multiplication preserves the symplectic form. One way to think about these paths, or one way to think about the groupoid elements, is that they are Hamiltonian paths. They are paths up to homotopy, but they're only Hamiltonian paths. So if, so if you use one of these paths, you have to stay along the symplectic leaves of the Poisson structure. That's basically what this groupoid consists of. It consists of the... Hamiltonian paths up to a notion of Hamiltonian uh, homotopy, uh, fixing the endpoints. Uh, and we have this symplectic form, which is compatible with the multiplication in the sense that the multiplication is a Lagrangian relation. And if the Poisson structure is zero, okay, then the groupoid is the cotangent bundle. And this explains why, in the Kähler case, we get the cotangent bundle. It's because the Poisson structure is non-existent, it's zero in the case of a usual Kähler structure. But if we take that complex structure and we turn on a holomorphic Poisson structure, then what happens is that this groupoid becomes non-trivial. In the case of the cotangent bundle, these uh, source and target fibers, they all agree and they're perfectly straight. But as you turn on the Poisson structure, they actually diverge from each other and the groupoid structure becomes non-trivial. So the A model approach to, to this quantization problem is going to occur in this real, um, in this real uh, uh, symplectic manifold, uh, the Weinstein symplectic groupoid. Okay. So in this, um, in this uh, Weinstein symplectic groupoid, we have the identity bisection. These are the 
paths which are constant paths. So that forms a Lagrangian inside. I drew it here uh, as just this uh, copy of M. Uh, it's just the identity arrows. Uh, we also have um, the source and the target map together give a map from the groupoid to the manifold cross itself um, with the generalized complex structure and its opposite. This opposite is associated to the negative holomorphic Poisson tensor. Okay, uh, so we just change the, change the sign of the Poisson tensor. And it turns out that this map is generalized holomorphic. Uh, this is a key property um, which was observed by Marius Krynik in his uh, paper in 2004 on um, integrability of uh, generalized complex structures. And it was also used in my paper with Mike Bailey uh, a few years ago in, in a similar, uh, for similar reasons uh, to integrate generalized complex structures. And um, here's the, the, the reason that this map is so important. It is because since it's generalized holomorphic, if I take two brains in M, I can produce the product brain in M cross M. I can pull it back and I get a brain, a single brain inside the groupoid. So given a pair of groupoids on, uh, sorry, given a pair of brains on the base, we can lift them to a single brain uh, on the groupoid. You can think of that single brain as being like an internal hum between I and J, BI and BJ. So we get an A brain this way. And then now we can, um, we can try to define the homomorphisms between these two brains as the homomorphisms in the A model between this Lagrangian and this space-filling brain. Okay, and this proposal, uh, this is a new proposal uh, from our paper, and it coincides with the proposal that we, you know, the description that I gave in the Kaler case, where we take a homomorphism between the zero section that's the zero section. And this is the space filling brain that I described on the uh, cotangent bundle. Okay, and then the other thing that I need to use, so that, that's how we get the quantization. That's the A model quantization of generalized complex structures. But I also wanna get the algebra. And just as in the cotangent case, I need to use the multiplication of the groupoid. And this gives, gives uh, a monoidal structure on the Foucault category and on the extended Foucault category, which includes these space-filling brains. Okay, this becomes a monoidal category where I can take a product of brains and take their product, take their tensor product or convolution. And then my algebra is given by the Homs between this identity bisection, which is an idempotent, um, and this sequence of tensor powers of this fundamental space-filling brain. So this is the main idea. And the, in the remainder of my talk, which is only a few minutes, I'm going to explain how we computed this, especially in the case of uh, toric varieties. So this is the main proposal for how we get the quantization. And notice that here we see the potential for non-commutativity. The, the potential for non-commutativity comes from the fact that the groupoid multiplication, right, is in no sense uh, com commutative. The, 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 the groupoid multiplication is an associative op operation. It induces a, um, uh, it, it induces a, uh, a convolution product on brains, but this convolution product is, uh, is not commutative. And um, in any case, you can see that because the groupoid structure has been deformed, that's where the opportunity for non-commutativity uh, lies. So let's see what happens when we actually do this. Okay, so how do we compute A model Homs between a Lagrangian and a space-filling brain? So this is a tricky, this is a tricky business. Um, it has not been fully uh, absorbed by mathematicians. We do not have a general, we do not have a general prescription for how to compute Homs uh, between these A-brains. Um, however, uh, there are some important uh, papers in the literature where this is done in special cases. One of them, the first one, was by Aldi and Zaslow. Another one was by Witten and Kapustin in their famous paper about geometric Langlands. And another one was by uh, Gukov and Witten. Um, uh, Gukov and Witten um, had a... Um, 
uh, have a, a very interesting and very closely related sequence of papers about an alternative approach to geometric quantization in which they describe geometric quantization as a pair of brains inside what they call a symplectic complexification. And that was a, a great inspiration to me in the development of this project. Uh, it, uh, it's basically the same idea, except I'm applying it, I'm applying the, the gukov witten idea in the case of symplectic groupoids. So anyway, it, there are three papers, essentially, those three papers where they actually compute examples of Hans between Lagrangian and space-filling brains. And we really need more uh, research uh, on this topic. These coisotropic A brains are important. Um, Konsevich has found examples which are not in the split closure of the, um, of the Fukai category. So they are not generated by Lagrangian submanifolds. So we do need to extend our ideas about the Fukai category. Uh, and um, well, uh, maybe the time is now. So anyone who uh, anyone who's looking for a research project, the Lagrangian to space filling is a uh, major problem, uh, if not the general case of uh, coisotropic A brains. So how do we define the homomorphism? Well, what do we do? We use the fact that we have this holomorphic prequantization, and we choose a holomorphic Lagrangian foli foliation. And we do basically what is done in geometric quantization, except we do a holomorphic version of it. So we take holomorphic flat sections along the holomorphic Lagrangian polarization of the space-filling brain, but we only take the Bohr-Sommerfeld leaves which intersect the Lagrangian. Okay, so that's what I did for the cotangent bundle and it worked. Let's see what happens for the groupoid. Um, so, Oh, uh, sorry. That was for the uh, that was for the quantization. That's what we take. Bo bohr sommerfeld leaves. Now for the algebra. For the algebra, we need to take the iterated convolution of this space filling brain with itself. I, I mentioned this in words. I use. I'm ho I, so if, then. Then one option. We, this is not strictly necessary, but this is what we do in our paper. We choose a a pre quantization which is multiplicative, and we choose a polarization. Uh, a, a holomorphic Lagrangian polarization, which is compatible with the groupoid structure. This is a very strong condition, and it will um, it will be necessary to get around this in the future. Um, and then uh, it is possible to uh, tensor the brain with itself several times, and take and define the Hom space by a sum over bohr sommerfeld leaves of the flat sections. Now the a uh, tricky thing here is that this multiplicative prequantization is going to be built from the individual prequantizations um, of the space filling brains in question. But uh, when you compose, when you multiply, there's going to be a multiplicative co cycle on the composable arrows of the groupoid. And so we need to know what that co cycle is in order to multiply sections to get our algebra. Okay, and so let me just very briefly explain um, how we implement this for Poisson varieties, toric Poisson varieties defined by an R matrix. So let's start with a toric Kähler manifold. Assume that we have a prequantization and, and a linearization of the action. So we have the action of the complex torus on the complex manifold, the real torus on the symplectic a Kähler manifold. And we lift this uh, action to an action on the pre-quantum bundle. That uh, was described first by Costant. So once we have a lift <clears throat> of the torus action to uh, the pre-quantum line bundle, um, uh, uh, right, so what we're going to do next is we're going to take this complex torus action and lift it to the cotangent bundle. When you do that, you see the real, the, the real torus action on the Kähler manifold, that has a real moment map. The complex torus action on this Kähler manifold does not have a moment map. It doesn't uh, preserve the symplectic form. But the action of this on the cotangent bundle does have a complex moment map to the complexification of the dual of the Lie algebra. So this is the complex moment map and gives you a completely integrable system on T star M. Now, if we take an R matrix, which is just an element of wedge 2T, which defines an invariant Poisson structure on the torus. So if you take this invariant Poisson structure on the torus, you can push it forward 
to the toric Kähler manifold, and you get a Poisson structure sigma c. You can take the lift of this action and push it forward, and you get a lift of the Poisson structure. So this means that the pre-quantum line bundle on this toric manifold is a Poisson module. So this means we can implement the deformation to get our brains. So, um, and then the next thing that we need is what the symplectic groupoid is. Well, um, symplectic groupoids, like I said, they have received a huge amount of study over the last 30, 35 years. And uh, for these toric R matrix Poisson structures, there's a beautiful construction by Ping Shu, um, which is extremely explicit and which just uses the action of the torus on the, um, on the uh, groupoid, on the, uh, on the cotangent bundle. So uh, what you do is you start with the cotangent bundle with this action and this moment map, and you notice that um, because there's a moment map, um, because there's a moment map, you can, you can take a point on the cotangent bundle. So let's say we take uh, a point in the cotangent bundle, okay? You can apply the moment map. That maps you into the dual of the Lie algebra. Then you can contract that with the R matrix, and that gives you something in the Lie algebra. And then you can exponentiate this Lie algebra element and get a group element, which is acting via the torus action on the projection of the covector co down to the base. And in this way, we, we deform the projection map to what is going to be the target map of the arrows of the groupoid. And if we uh, flow in the opposite direction, same group element, same Lie algebra element, except negated, right, exponentiate that, that's going to give us the source. So as you can see, the, this, this single projection map has been deformed in one way to give the source and in the other way to give the target, both mapping down to the manifold. And the, the multiplication is also deformed in a similar way, except that now we need to use the exponentiation and the action on the cotangent bundle, because now I, I'm saying that um, uh, I'm taking two elements of the group of the cotangent bundle, which agree tip to tail. So I should be able to compose them. And in order to compose them, what I need to do is drag one of them back drag the other one forward, oops, drag this one back and this one forward so that they lie in the same cotangent fiber and then I can add them together using the cotangent addition. So you see that this multiplication is a deformation of the cotangent addition. And it turns out that the pre-quantum line bundle requires no, de no, de uh, um, no deformation at all. It turns out that the line bundle and the, and the holomorphic symplectic form on the cotangent bundle requires no deformation whatsoever. It's only the structure of the groupoid that needs to be deformed, but not the pre-quantum line bundle. And then the last piece of data we need is the co-cycle for two composable arrows, which is given by this dragging action of the section. These are two sections of the pre-quantum bundle. Okay, how do we multiply them together? To multiply two sections of the pre-quantum line bundle, we need to drag, drag, tensor them together. This is the usual way that you tensor sections of a line bundle together. And then you need to correct that by this uh, R matrix contracted on the image of the two points in the dual of the Lie algebra. So this is a kind of beautiful but complicated formula which we need to use to multiply sections. And finally, um, we need to find the bohr sommerfeld leaves for our um, pre-quantization, uh, for our, um, for our uh, quantization procedure. So uh, these brains, which we built by taking the space-filling brain on the groupoid and convolving it with itself k times, okay, um, that has a uh, completely integrable system, a map to, to the dual of the complex Lie algebra with holomorphic Lagrangian fibers. And we need to look at those fibers. All of these fibers have the topology of a torus, so they have a non-trivial um, bohr sommerfeld condition. And if you look at the bohr sommerfeld leaves for this brain, what you'll get is all integer lattice points in the dual of the real Lie algebra. 
So all of the all of the lattice points in the dual of the algebra contribute to Bohr-Sommerfeld leaves. So, um, but but most of these Bohr-Sommerfeld leaves do not intersect the identity bisection. If you look at the ones that do intersect, you get only a finite number, and they consist of the integer lattice point that are in the Delzant polytope for k times the symplectic form. And so, so this means that uh, uh, depending on the value of k, we get a certain finite number of uh, contributions, and you get a finite dimensional vector space. And so um, this is the final theorem of our paper, uh, which is going up later today, um, theorem of myself and Francis Bischoff, which is that the algebra of this proposal is the homo uh, uh, and the homogeneous coordinate ring of the toric variety. Um, so in other words, the, the non-commutative algebra, which has been deformed by the R matrix, and the homogeneous coordinate ring of the original toric variety are the same vector space. It's the same exact vector space, but the multiplication has been deformed in the following way, that if we take two homogeneous sections, which have a certain weight for the torus action, and if we multiply them, we get this expression, which involves the R matrix evo uh, evaluated on the weights. And if we compute them in two orders, then we see that F star G and G star F are not the same, but they differ by this uh, small factor, uh, which is very reminiscent of the non-commutative torus. It's just that in this case, this is a um, holomorphic non-commutative torus, and it's been compactified to a non-commutative um, uh, a non-commutative toric variety. So um, I hope that um, I hope that this talk will serve as a good introduction to the paper. Um, we relied on many uh, uh, many years of interaction with many different communities in order to do this work: uh, the Poisson geometry community, the mathematical physics community, um, generalized complex structures, um, and the people who studied topological quantum field theories and the Fukai category. Um, and so, um, uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Marco. Um, are there any questions or comments, either here in the room or online? So you can unmute yourself, right, and ask a question. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, so my question is basically in this picture that you had, right, these uh, four squares somehow. Um, so basically, if there is like some field theoretic interpretation, um, for, yeah, this one. If there is like this, like like a field theory interpretation um, from uh, the lower left to the lower right, in terms of the Poisson sigma model, for example, because the phase space there is given as a symplectic groupoid, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Another interesting thing is like the when you have this square, um, the upper square on the right to the lower square on the right, right? You are doing like an integration, right? Which yeah. If, if, if you have yeah. something that is a bit more general, for example, would not always be uh, possible, right? Um, yes, that's true, yes. But, but there's... Interestingly, okay, yeah. I mean, there is, um, there is this notion that was developed by Cataneo and Contreras where they talk about something that is called a relational symplectic group point, yes, which yes, actually always gives you... Um, like, it always appears as an integration of... A, yeah, I mean, the, the, so do you have basically two questions, comments? So let, let me address uh, the first one uh, first. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, there is, um, yeah, so there is something very interesting for 2D sigma models here, 3D and 2D sigma models here. So um, the, uh, the point is, is that the, um, the original model, which gave rise uh, to the A model and the B model. It's, it's a, mo a two-dimensional sigma model, supersymmetric, with values in the Kähler manifold. And actually, secretly, it's a 3D model, 
uh, because it has a Wesumino term, a topological Wesumino term, which is an integration over a three manifold with boundary whose boundary is the sigma of the, of the 2D supersymmetric sigma model. And this 3D model, um, you can kind of imagine that by integrating out one direction, it becomes a two-dimensional model on the reduced phase space that you obtain by integrating out this one, one direction. Uh, or if you wanted to think of the model as being initially a 2D model and ignore the Wesumino term, then that 2D model could be reduced to a 1D model on the phase space uh, that Catano and Felder explained was equal to the symplectic groupoid. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of eliding the relationship between the A model and the uh, Poisson sigma model. They are related, but they're not exactly the same. So the, the point is that there is a uh, field theory explanation for why the bottom row should be important. The bottom row is a kind of dimensional reduction uh, of, the, uh, of the original model um, that... Uh, that uh, gave rise to the A and the B model. Uh, so I, I've been studying this more recently, um, but uh, I can't really say more than that. Um, but but uh, the, the, the basic point is that um, this Lagrangian brain and, and this space-filling brain, right? these two brains, they would give the two boundary conditions for this uh, dimensionally reduced model or this integrated out model. Uh, and um, the model has a kind of mixed uh, metric and uh, topological type. As it's kind of like the metric comes as a boundary term. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very interesting for field theory that we found, like we developed the bottom row by necessity, but it, if, if we, we're now gonna go back to field theory and say, you know, what, what does this tell us about the 2D sigma model or the 3D sigma model? It's telling us something convenient about how to think about, um, you know, the, the phase space. Now, the, the second thing that you mentioned is about integrability and about the fear, and this is a widespread fear, that, that, that your Poisson structure will not be integrable. Because uh, you know, the people who study uh, integrability of Poisson, Poisson manifolds, they, they are, are so detailed and so uh, they've mastered that subject to such an extent, especially the work of Krynik and Fernandez, that, that they found all the obstructions for integrating these Poisson structures. But the point is that in, in many, many, many interesting cases, which we would love to be able to quantize, vast numbers of these Poisson structures are known to be uh, integrable, and we have the groupoids integrating them explicitly now. This has been through the work of the community over many years. So, uh, so it, while, I, while I agree with you that, um, that there are some, uh, some interesting cases which are not integrable, they are, uh, there are there's a notion of them that are, and um, I think that it, um, I, I think that that should be kept in mind, because you know what, what I'm presenting here is an opportunity to actually use all of that hard work uh, to 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 obtain something that we really uh, want. We we want we really want to have a geometric approach to these non-commutative algebraic geometry spaces, and. Um, there's a potential now for using all of this symplectic groupoid technology for this purpose. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's just my propaganda for integ integrability. The, thank but you are uh, absolutely thank you. right. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we would have to close this Q&A session because we are somewhat behind the schedule. Let's give Marco another huge applause. Okay, thank you. So we'll have a break and we'll resume 10 minutes uh, behind the schedule at uh, 5.40.